Even though you turned your back on me, you lied on me, you cheated on me, you left me, I still love you. And we got to get to that point where we're that committed to being who God is as well. That we want to love him just like he loves us. That we want to have unconditional love just like he has for us. That we have to show others that same love. Giving that same grace. That it doesn't matter. That I, I can't treat you like I did when I was in the world. I can't do that. Because I've been given another chance, right? She said it. We've been given another chance. So we, we can't stay in the same place that we used to be. We can't always give somebody a piece of your mind. Because then you're going to be in the nut house. Because you done gave everybody their mind. Now you can't think for yourself. But if we continue to push forward to being more like God and walking in his destiny that he has prepared for us in our new life, in the new us, in the new creation, God created me a clean heart and renewed the right spirit within me. Right? So that's all that we're saying this morning. So y'all just worship just a little bit before we receive this dynamic word from First Lady Gray. Amen. But y'all just allow the words to minister to you and let you just really think about that and meditate on the love of God. Hallelujah. I lift my hands and toes and rage
just want to stand right now because she's coming. But I need y'all to just lift that in the air. That you really love her more than anything. missionary in her absence, amen, Mother Nicholson, 
Glory to God and our musicians. I thank God just for y'all and the visitors that are here today. Amen, my cousin. I see you, girl. <laughs> I thank God um, for all that make the gathering. And, and, you know, just the fivefold ministry, you know, then that consists of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. That way I, I just cover everybody, okay? Amen. That way I don't leave anyone out. I don't go have to go back in and acknowledge anyone because I forgot or forgot a name, but it's something about having to go back for me, you know. I don't really like to do it that much, so. <laughs> so I remember a time when I was, when I was younger, you know, I was brought to church, I was raised in the church, I was, I was born in the church, so I remember a time we used to have to go to Sunday services, and then we'll have a three o'clock service on Sunday. Then we'll go back on Wednesday night for prayer. Then we'll go for Friday night Bible study. And I just told myself at a young age, you know, when I get older, I'm not coming back. I ain't coming back. And I know I'm not the only one that's probably said that, you know. But um, when I got to college, and I began to be out on my own and have to get my own food and different things, you know, start adulting. Yeah. You know, I was looking for a church then. I wanted to find a church, you know, but it was something about your home church. I wanted to get back home and I was about two hours away, but I wanted to get back home. So, you know, I, I hated that. I, I, I went back on what I said at one time, you know, I called my mom and I was like crying because it's hard when you're adulting, when you're learning how to make it for yourself and make it on your own. I called my mom back and said, mom, I want to go back. I'm coming back. Can, can, can you pick me up for church? Because at sometimes we, we need to go back. And, and, and in the place that I went back, we all have these different experiences, but Mine was, I wanted to reconnect with my past experiences. I had certain experiences in our life, uh, it holds a special place in our heart. So I wanted to get back to my home church. I wanted to revisit that feeling of memories and happiness. Have y'all ever been there before? Yeah. Ever been driving down the road and you were like, hey, that's, that's where I used to stay. You want to revisit those memories and tell your children about those good times and those fun times that you used to have at those places. But I thank God. I thank God that I, I, I came back. And if you would turn with me to Exodus 4, chapter 4, Verses 18 through 21. Amen. And there are not that many verses. So if you don't mind, as Pastor always says, um, to indulge us on standing for the word of God. And again, the chapter is Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. And it says, Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, and I wish you well. Now, the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. In verse 20, it says, so Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. You know, God would equip us to go when he tells us to go. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. In other words, go out and show out. But I will harden the, his heart so that he will not let the people go. Amen. We thank God for the reading of the word. But as you're going back down to your seats, will you do me a favor and will you just look at somebody next to you and will you tell them I'm coming back? I'm coming back. Amen. I'm coming back. And it, and it may take a while, but I'm coming back. And it may be tough, but I'm coming back. And it may look rough, but I'm coming back. 
And sometimes it gets difficult, but I'm coming back. And sometimes I may even look rough, but I'm coming back. So let me summarize where we are at in, in this chapter of Exodus. Um, I, I could tell y'all the story because it's a familiar story, but let me tell it for some of those that don't know. Um, we In this chapter, or previous chapters in chapter two, we learned that Moses was raised as an Egyptian prince. But as he got older, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and Moses looked around, and he saw nobody was there. So he didn't see anyone, and he struck the Egyptian man, and he killed the man, and he hid his body in the sand. But how many know that somebody is always watching? Somebody is always watching. Scripture says in Proverbs 15 and 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So the next day, Moses went out, and he saw two, two Hebrew men now fighting. And he tried to intervene, but the Hebrew man said to him, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian man? Moses realized his crime was known. And he realized that someone has seen him. My mama used to tell me oftentimes as growing up as a girl, she would tell me these two sayings, and it used to get on my nerve, but I say it to my kids now. She said this, honey, what's done in the dark, it's gonna come to the light. And what don't come out in the wash, it's gonna come out in the rinse. So what we think we're doing in secret, what we think we're doing in, in, in private where nobody knows, somebody is watching you. And God says, he is, the Lord's eyes is, is in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So can you imagine now how Moses felt when the Hebrew asked him, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian man? Can you imagine the exposure? Some of us don't like to be exposed. Has it, have anybody ever been there? I know I've been there. I know I've been there. I've been exposed before. Hallelujah, Jesus. I was playing that guitar and sinking. I was singing in the choir and sinking and singing. I know I've been exposed before. Hallelujah, Jesus. But it, if you can imagine how he felt, the embarrassment, the shame, the guilt, the regret, the fear, the discomfort, the anxiety, the nervousness, the disappointment, the insecurity, the powerlessness, and the uncertainty. The uncertainty feeling that came upon him, which caused Moses to run. But somebody tap your neighbor and tell him he's coming back. He coming back. And some of us are like Moses, amen. Some of us are like Moses. We are. Some of us are called to, to do what Moses is being called to do. And some of us are like Moses when we get exposed in different things, we take off running. Oh. Yeah. We hide. Yeah. Or some of us can be, even be like David. David. David was anointed. He was anointed. He, he, he had success. And because of his anointing and because of his popularity, he went and he hid in caves and in the wilderness to hide from King Saul. And some of us are anointed and successful and some of us are, are, are popular with other people, but because of our King Saul's in our lives, the people that we don't want to offend, we go and we hide what God has given us. Because we don't want to offend anybody and we don't want to make anybody think we're better or anything. But how many know that because of your light, yes. our lights are not supposed to be hidden. I want to encourage somebody on today because we all, some of us have gifts and talent that we are hiding, but let me encourage you because Matthew 5 and 14 says, ye are the light of the world. A city that's set 
on a hill that cannot be hid. And this is how God's people are. We're just visible. Others can see. Others can see your good deeds and your actions. You shine bright. What you are doing, you shine so bright. And your positivity is so influencing that it draws other people in. But it glorifies the Father in heaven. But let me get back to the Moses story. So Moses, he ran. And when Pharaoh found out about this, Pharaoh said, you know, I'm going to kill him. He tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled, to, fled from Egypt and went to Midian. And if we read this in chapter 2, verse 23, he says, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slave because their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant. His covenant is a promise, right? Amen. Sunday school kids. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So so in verse 25, so God looked on the Israelites and he, he was concerned about them. God made a promise which God is a father that he can he cannot lie. He shall not lie. And he made a promise with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that, that he was going to come back for his people. Yep. Amen. And in chapter 3, Moses, Moses was married at this time. And Moses was tending to his father-in-law's sheep. And when he encountered the burning bush that was not consumed by flames, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the fire from within the bush. And God called his name. Moses. Has God ever called your name? Mm. What was your response? She just found that. What was your response when God called your name? Moses said, he answered, I'm here. Here I am. Are we like Moses? Are we saying here I am? I'm looking at some of y'all. Some of y'all are some Moses that's supposed to be some Moseses for your families. That's supposed to be some Moses is to draw other people. Yeah. Are we being like Moses and saying, here I am? Yeah. I know God called some of y'all. I'm not going to pick on y'all today. I won't. But when he calls us, are we like Jonah? <laughs> Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh to preach. But he fled and went the opposite way. God told him to go so... He caused a great storm to come on the ship that Jonah was on. Yep. And because of his disobedience, Jonah had to be thrown overboard. How many know that our response to God can cause our, a blessing or a storm? Come on. Uh -oh. And it's not only affecting you, <laughs> but it's affecting the people around you. Him hiding on that ship was affecting the people on the ship. Amen. His sin, his disobedience was affecting the people around him. Amen. What do you think it does when, it, when we sin? And what do you think it does in our homes, in our families? It, it not only affects you, your children are watching you. Amen. Your family is watching you. Yeah. Believe it or not, they watch you. Yeah. They watch you. So... Moses answered and said, here I am. And he made his way closer to the bush, but listen to this. But before he could get closer to the presence of God, God stopped him. And he said, take off your sandals, for this is holy ground. Wait a minute. Before we can go into God's presence, we got to take off some things. Before we can come into his presence, we got to pull off some things. We got to become pure before we can come into his presence. We got to take off the impurity. Hmm. You see, this was a sign of respect and hum humility. To remove one sandal when entering the holy place, by Moses removing his sandal, he showed reverence and respect for God's presence. He acknowledged his unworthiness to stand before God. How are we stepping to God? How are we coming up in here to God? 
I know the Bible says come as you are, but it doesn't say stay there. Well, that's good. Come on. Amen. I know, I know it's gonna be tight anyway. Amen. And he said, how are, so, so he said, take off your shoes for this is holy ground. Holy God. Anyway, come, come in here with some respect on it. Put some respect on it. Because in this right here, you can't come in here any kind of way. In, the, in, in these days and time in the Old Testament, if, if you weren't sacrificing those bulls, the priest had to do so much before he could come into the holy temple. And if he didn't come in there the right way, he was going to be struck dead. But I know we living in a grace and mercy sensation. But we got to we got to go back to the days of oh and remember. Yes. That's good. Remember. And for us women, since this is women's day, how how are our outfits? How are our outfits? How are our attire honoring God? When we get up in the morning, do we say it's just honoring to God? And do we get up in the morning, God, is this pleasing to you? You know, we say we want to do everything in the way he wants us to do. We want to be in his will. But are we really asking him, God, before I even put this on, is this honoring you? The scripture says in, in 1 Timothy 2 and 9, I, in like manner, also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. How are we coming to him? It's tight, but it's right. Holiness is still right. I'm still, I'm, I was born and raised a Pentecostal girl, so I, it's still a little Pentecostal in me. Hallelujah, Jesus. It ain't gonna never leave. Holiness is still right. Amen. It's a standard. Modest Chappelle, I ain't telling you you gotta go and put on the longest dress and put on the longest. I'm telling you, just make sure you cover, sis. Uh, yes. Yes. Amen. Make sure you cover. Here we go. Then, Another another way we come into his presence. Are we sober coming into his presence? Second Timothy 4 and 5 says in the NASB version, but you be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Be sober in all things. What does that mean to be sober? To be sober in all things means to have a clear head. Mm -hmm. It means to be level-headed mm -hmm. in all aspe aspects of your life. It means to be free from excessive ex emotions, irrational distractions, approach a sense of rationality and avoid extreme emotional behavior. It also means being focused and disciplined. Mm -hmm. Self-control is needed. And I like about that scripture, it says, do the work of an evangelist. That means I'm not just going to stay in these four walls. That means to do the work of an evangelist, I'm going to go out and spread the gospel and teach other people to try to get them to compel them to come. But how are we step into God? Moses was symbolically purifying himself to receive God's message. This is an act. This act is a symbol to us to ask God to remove any unclean or impure thing. In chapter three, verse 10, it says, so now I go, I am sending you Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? How many of us doubt in ourselves? When God tells us to do something, we doubt, but he's gonna equip you with whatever you have, whatever mission he's put you here, placed you here on this earth to do, whatever assignment he has given you to do, he's gonna equip you with the right people that are assigned to you to help you fulfill that mission. He's gonna equip you with the right tools and things that you need to, to fulfill that mission. That's right, amen. In verse 12 it says, and God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on the mountain, on this mountain. Now we said it. God said, 
I'm coming back. He told, he told Moses to go back. So he's coming back. And it's not by, it's not by our own power that we come back because it's some of us that are coming back. We're coming back to the church. We're coming back. We're coming back and we're understanding now that I need to be here. So we're coming back and we understand that it's not by our own might. It's not by our own power, but it's by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's changed and transformed our life. And in my closing, I'm not going to be here long, see? And in my closing, just like God sent Moses to free and deliver his chosen people to Israel, God also sent his only begotten son, as Sister Kia was saying, he, only, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us so that you and I can be free from sin. But he didn't say that he was going to stay there. I love that part. He didn't stay dead. Amen. On the third day, he rose again with all power in his hand. He, he met with his disciples according to Acts 1 and 8. And he told them, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be a witness unto me, both Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud and received him out of the sight. But somebody ought to look at your neighbor and say, he's coming back. He's coming back. God said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If there were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That, that where I am, ye may be also. I can hear the Lord saying to me. I can hear him saying, I'm coming back. I may have been off the scene for a while, but I'm coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may have forgot about me, but I'm coming back. <laughs> they may have counted me out, but I'm coming back. Yeah. I'm coming back. And I can hear the old saints of old head of my seat. I can hear the old saints saying, he's coming back. And I can hear them say, he's coming back after the church without a spot or a blemish. And who head of my seat of my God. I can hear him saying, hallelujah, Jesus, glory be to God. When I look at the word church, he gave me this abbreviation. He told me it's an abbreviation for church is CH. And if you look at church, it's a CH in the front. But in the middle, it says you are. And at the end, it says another CH. You are church. Glory to God. So you are church. So church, get ready. For the Lord is soon to come. And I can hear the Lord saying, I'm coming back. In the moment and in the twinkling of the eye. I'm coming back. I hear my seat. You better get ready. Because he's coming back. But I want to leave you with this scripture because I don't want you to be ignorant. The first of lessons 4 and 13, he says, be, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning them that are fall asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto, the, unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the, the, the trumpet, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet him in the air. So you better get ready because he's coming back. And I don't want you to be like the ten virgins. Five was wise and the other five was foolish. It's just like that teaching. It's just like that parable. We are, you are the church. We are the church. We are his bridegroom. And he's coming back after a church. He's coming back after 
after a church without a spot or a blemish. We got to be ready. Don't be like the other five foolish women that when, you know, see, when the bridegroom came, they was gone and locked out of the house. They couldn't enter in. Because I said he's coming like a twinkling of the eye. The scripture don't lie. Hallelujah, Jesus. We better be ready. We better get ready. And that's time for us to get ready today. While, we, while the blood is yet still warm and warm in our veins, we have time to get ready. We have an opportunity. Every day we wake up, we have a second chance. Every day we get up in the morning, we have another chance to give God our very best. I may not have got it right yesterday. I may not have got it right at the gas station when the attendant was, 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 was making me frustrated. I may not have got it right with my kids, but I'm coming back. I may have been gone a long time, but I'm coming back. It may seem hard and it may look rough, but I'm coming back. And I hear the Lord saying, get ready, come on back home. Get ready and come on back home. Because God wants to save us. He wants us to be in fellowship and be caught up in the middle of the air with him. So I'm coming back. Be careful what we say. Be, be careful for the words that we use. Use our wisdom. Be like the wise women and be ready. I don't want to say get ready. But you have an opportunity if you're not ready to get ready. Because that's what kind of God we serve. He's on the the right hand of the Father. He's making intercession for you. Every time you, every time we make a mistake, the thing I like about it in this sensation that we're in, can do wrong, I'm telling you we have a Savior that is standing on the right hand side of God pleading your case. He's pleading for you. Him a little bit more time. Give him a little bit more time. I know she's coming. She's coming back. Give him a little bit more time. Give him a little bit more time. He's coming back. So I thank God. I thank God that we have a Savior that went to die on that cross for us so that you and I may live again. That we might be free. God is so good. And if you don't have, if you don't have it right with God, please don't leave here like you came. I beg you. I know life happens. We all go through some things. We all go through tests and trials. We all have situations that a cure or temptation come. But he said, I'll make a way of escape for you. Are we taking that escape? I hear the Lord saying that the way is already made for you. I've already prepared the way. He just waiting on you. We talking about what we trying to handle, what we got, what we struggling with. He waiting on you. He is Jehovah Gibba. He'll fight your battles for you. Every situation that you're going through is no problem too big or too small. He just waiting on you. Make the foot. Take, take the step. Move your feet. He right there with arms wide open. He never left you. But we have... Like the prodigal son went our own way. But just like the prodigal son, he had to come back home. He realized, I'm coming back. There's some of us that are, are, are trying to come back, but it seems like we're, we, we, we don't. 
we don't understand that we don't have to fix the situation. I think we're so controlling, that controlling spirit, that we gotta be in control of things. We don't have to fix this. Give it over to God, he'll fix it for you. He'll fix it, and when you pray, don't worry. My God will fix it, and I know he will. Amen, so be encouraged. Continue to do what God is calling you to do. I didn't come to beat up on nobody, but I know God is still calling for holiness. Holiness is still the standard. I know we're living in different times, but holiness is still a standard. How we treat one another is still a standard. Yes. Our light is showing on how we treat one another. We don't have to carry a Bible under our arms, but just by going into a grocery store and speaking to someone, our light is showing. Continue to show your light. Don't don't let it dim. And be be careful about those that are that you surround yourself with because some of us get around folks and we try to dim our lights because we know that there's jealousy, hatred, and bitterness towards us. And so when we we get around certain people, we try to dim that light. But God said, continue to be you. Continue to be you. Continue to be who he's called you to be. And I just thank God. I just thank God on today. And I'm going to turn it into the hands of Pastor Gray. Thank you for the opportunity. Come on, can we bless the name of the Lord for the Lady Gray? Come on, we can do better than that, amen, for our First Lady. Can we give God praise for her? Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, look at somebody and tell them I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Come on, can you look at somebody and encourage them, tell them you coming back. You coming back. Come on, come on, just a, just a little bit more. Come on, you coming back. You coming back. I know you may feel down now, but the fight isn't over. You coming back. Come on, I know you've been knocked down, but you, you coming back. You coming back. Huh? Come on, encourage somebody. Tell them, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I, I've been down for a little bit. I, the devil, he, he won a few rounds, but I'm coming back, I'm coming back. I feel my second wind coming. Come on, so I, I, I feel a renewed energy. I feel a renewed peace coming. I'm coming back. Hallelujah. We thank and praise God just for the word. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm encouraged. You know, as she begins to speak, you know what, what crossed my mind? The goal of the gospel is not to affirm you. The goal of the gospel is not to celebrate you. The goal of the gospel is not to accept you. But the goal of the gospel is to rescue you. It's to transform you. It's to redirect you in the, in the direction that you should be going. Listen, we've all been there and said, I made some mistakes. I went left when God said go right. I, I, I stayed a little bit longer than I should have, but I, I'm encouraged today that I'm coming back. I'm redirecting. The, come on, is that anybody's testimony today? I, I'm redirecting today. Come on, I, I, I'm ready for the transformation to take place. I, I, I diddled and daddled for a little while, but I, I'm ready to give my entire yes to the Lord. Come on, if that's you, come on, wave your hands right where you are. Hallelujah. Come on, we're standing all over the building. Lady Gray, come stand with me. As the word was going forth, as the word was going forth, what I heard God say is that this is a time of restoration. Yeah. It's not a coincidence that you heard the title, I'm coming back. And then you heard from Sister Kia a second chance. It wasn't coordinated, am I right? Testify to me. It's not a coincidence. But what I heard God say is that this is about to be the season of restoration for somebody. What, what I heard God say is what, what he's about to do now is he's about to repair something. He's about to repair some relationships. He's about to repair some relationships. He's about to repair uh, uh, some damage that has been done in battle. Not only is he about to repair some things, he's about to reconstruct. 
reconstruct some things. So, so, some things can, can, can't be put back together unless they be fully reconstructed. He's about to reconstruct some things in your life to get you to the place where you can honestly say, I'm coming back. Thank you. 